Welcome to Be Provided Conservation Radio, sharing stories and information about the environment, wildlife, and the people who are dedicating their lives to protect the world for future generations. These inspirational stories will take you from the Santa Cruz Mountains to remote areas of Africa. Here are your hosts. Hi everyone, welcome back to Be Provided Conservation Radio. Uh, Today our interview was recorded a couple weeks ago and it was done over the phone. So I just wanted to let you know that, that there are some little blips in the audio that you will hear, but it is perfectly fine. And I hopefully I have caught most of those blips and re-recorded some of the inaudible moments. So, and one of those inaudible moments was the introduction. And so I wanted to let you know that this interview today, our guest, Rebecca Dimitrick, she's the co-owner with her husband, Dwayne Titus, of the Humane Wildlife Control, which provides sound, ethical, and lasting solutions to wildlife problems. Rebecca is also the founder and director of a nonprofit, National Association for Wildlife Emergency Services, and is author of the book, Wildlife Search and Rescue, a guide for first responders. So I welcomed Rebecca to the show, and she graciously accepted, and then I began to ask her about what got her started and in, in, and involved with working with animals. And so here we go with today's show. Enjoy. I guess it started back with my mom. You know, um, she allowed us to, to have pets, uh, all sorts of pets, snakes, mice, um, so on, and um nice. I remember, I talk about this in my book, is I remember a moment so clearly when she, um, my hamster, I had a pet hamster, and it was a very chilly night in Brentwood, I guess, and he started hibernating, but I thought he was dead. So to me, you know, he's kind of stiff, and he's curled up, and he's not moving, and I, I went to my mom, and I said, oh, my gosh, you know, he's dead, and she said, no, 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 let's just, you know, do some basics here, and, and she warmed him up in front of in front of the stove. She opened the stove door to allow some of the heat to come out, and put him there on a towel, and he came alive. And I thought that was like a miracle to me, right? <laughs> My beloved hamster was alive, and I that was that, and, and her continued compassion for animals. She would always pick up the strays and, and the broken and orphaned of everything. And so she showed me a lot of of that, of compassion towards other beings, and I think that that set me on this path to um, to work with with animals in this way. Did she work with animals on a professional level? Uh, she was an actress. <laughs> oh, she was. <laughs> she was a crazy actress. I grew up in a Hollywood family, and she, but she just had this other side to her. No offense to actors and actresses, um, but she just had this other side that was really un, kind of oddly down really down to earth i mean i yeah. remember her picking a um this is gross a, an embedded flea collar um oh, yeah. it was embedded in a cat around its shoulders and its mm-hmm. neck and we sat in my bedroom and when i was really young and i remember her just painstakingly going through and pulling it out and doctoring the wound and we kept the cat and we found it a good home Tallulah, oh, i think it yeah that's right its name was Tallulah because she had a very deep voice Oh. <laughs> oh, that's great. What a great, great childhood with animals and such. So you grew up in the L.A. area, I take it, or Hollywood area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Bel Air, Brentwood, and then we moved out to Malibu, which really I blossomed out there with the wilderness, and I got really connected to, to nature and um, the wild. That's kind of when I got involved in, in rescuing even rattlesnakes. They would let me, <laughs> I don't oh, wow. know what parent would do this. <laughs> but maybe they were trying to get rid of me. Um, they would let me pick up rattlesnakes when I was 13. I, I took a herpetology class in high school because high schools at that time had really cool classes like that. Wow. I learned how to catch snakes and lizards safely and, and safely for the animal's sake as well. And yeah. I would rescue rattlesnakes out of people's backyards so they wouldn't kill them. And so that kind of also led to um, what I do today. I love it. So was the rattlesnake one of your first uh, solo rescues that you did, or um, did you, what was your first, you know, without your mom's help? Do you remember your first wow, rescue? Wow, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I think it was, 
I think one of my first rescues was a pelican entangled in fishing line down in oh, Acapulco, wow. and nobody was going to its rescue. Aww. Oh, God, I don't remember how old I was, but I was young, younger. I mean, I was down there. Um, I was probably 22, maybe. I've been working with wildlife before that, so I don't know, but that just comes yeah. to mind that that was a real... That was an early one. I mean, I mean, it was. I don't. Need, that's a great one. I, we can come back to that maybe. Okay. Think. You could say I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought of it. <laughs> There's been so many. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you started at such a young young age, so yeah, that's great. Did the pelican survive? Do you remember? Yeah, I was I was down there with a, a boyfriend, and we saw this pelican that was trying to fly off, but it would continually be pulled back down because it was tangled it it had swallowed a fish fish hook and it couldn't take flight so he and i swam out there and and collected it and this young guy named tarzan who was helping us um you know accommodating us while we were on our stay there tarzan um he Perfect. cut the line with his teeth oh my god <laughs> yeah it was pretty cool <laughs> So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how you you actually got started with the nonprofit world? So I started um, some nonprofits down in Southern California. One of them is still operating. It's called the California Wildlife Center. But up here in the Monterey Bay area, I run the, for short, it's called Wildlife Emergency Services. And we basically act as paramedics. We'll take some calls, uh, try and do first aid over the phone, um, we have a few volunteers that go out and actually do rescues. Um, but we have two really great groups in the Monterey Bay area. There's the SPCA for Monterey. They have a wildlife center. And then we have Native Animal Rescue in Santa Cruz. So between those two, they do a great job of covering um, animals that are in distress. So we're, we've, we've kind of um, backed off rescues. Uh, oh. So that we're only on call for technical, really difficult rescues. Most of the work we do center, centers around our business, humane wildlife control. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where we focus on kind of preventing problems for people. A- anything from like mice to mountain lions, anything that people are having problems with in and around their homes is what my husband and I are focused on helping through the business. So it's my understanding that um, humane wildlife control is a for-profit business and separate from your nonprofit business? We we separated out from the nonprofit because it just started getting really big and, and more effort being put into that. So we, mm-hmm. we made it into its own separate thing. It's, it is a business. I hate to use the word pest, um, oh, so I true. argue yeah. wildlife control, but it is most people would say, oh, it's a pest control company. And, yes, we are unfortunately – classified at this point in time as pest control. We're also called nuisance wildlife control operators. Um, that is something, it's a thing. <laughs> but again, we're, we're coming from a little different perspective. We're, we're an unconventional, if you will, pest control company. We look at the, the core problem. We find the core problem, and the, that's not the animal. A lot of people think, if I get rid of this animal, I'll get rid of my problem. Mm-hmm. But the animals aren't the problem. They're a symptom. Their presence is a symptom of the problem. The problem is, in most cases, a source of food, a reliable source of food a resource that animals can depend on. And when you have that, then the animals move in. I mean, we, are we humans and animals, are all linked to a food resource. You mm-hmm. can't live without it, right? Mm-hmm. right? So in urban environments, we see such an uptick in in conflicts with wildlife and humans because we are sloppy, we humans, and we we want lush gardens and we want waterfalls and koi ponds and gardens and orchards. And we so we make these artificial ecosystems that are rich in resources and can support more more animals, more wild animals than in, in nature. Yeah. When I when I do my talk I, I, I show a, a, a chaparral, the chaparral mountains, and in the background is Los Angeles. And I say, where would you go for food? Where would you live for the food resources? You're going to go into the city. Mm-hmm. So there's more food resources there, and that's what the animals do. Yeah, I kind of learned the hard way with putting out a bird feeder in our yard, which you know attracted birds as I wanted, but it also attracted other 
critters who like that food as well who eventually find their way into our homes such as as rats and mice <laughs> you think that uh, you're putting the food out there for the birds you know right. trap birds and they're not a problem and and then here you have all the rats coming in the ground squirrels gophers and then what eats them are the yeah. coyotes so for people that have small pets you don't want to be attracting the the small animals that will then attract the predators. Yeah. yeah. So people yeah. don't think that, you know, one little thing that you're doing might um, cascade into many, many problems. Yeah. And you don't realize it. And that's what we're here to do is to help you assess your yard, evaluate what you're doing so that we can – we're all about protecting people, pets, their property, mm-hmm. and the wildlife. We can absolutely live in balance, in harmony – with the animals. We have to respect them. And I was just watching a video this morning that was, was excellent. It was produced by, um, I think, the Department of Fish and Wildlife with a police department in Southern California. And it was saying, you know, every time you put out food for your pet and don't pick it up, you're disrespecting wildlife. Every time you put, for example, a bird feeder or, or this or that that's going to attract wildlife, you're disrespecting wildlife in a sense. Yeah. And we need to yeah. start respecting where we live. We we live in their habitat. And, you know, we, we can protect your house. Our company can come out and protect your house. I always tell my customers, it's, we're going to make your house like an eggshell. It's mm-hmm. going to be breathable, but nothing's going to get in. And I go, this is your space. That out there is their space. Unless you want to have a little garden, I can protect that for you too. But we have to share because mm-hmm. they're not going anywhere. Okay? Right. You can't kill your way out of this. And when you try, and when you use poisons, then then you're you know you're killing everything. So I hope this is a, a good question, but I was wondering how how would you go about assessing you know a home like mine up in the up in the woods here in the redwoods where I do have a bird feeder. I no longer really keep the bird seed out at night anymore, but I do keep the the bird baths out. So I wasn't sure how would you go about assessing a home like mine like you know we've we've gone through with the expandable foam and plugged up some you know holes that we've seen etc so i was just wondering if that was a good question yeah no that's a it's a great yeah. question um and, and and yeah right off the bat i can i can mention a few things so okay. expandable foam do not use expandable foam oh they don't okay. right through it no oh. i know and okay. we go into these homes. first it's ugly too and it is, you right through it. Um, okay. And then it takes more work for us or a company like us to come in, and we actually have to remove the foam and do it properly. Okay. We use galvanized and stainless steel um, hardware cloth, so it's quarter uh-huh. inch. Don't use anything larger than quarter inch. You want um, quarter yeah, inch hardware can, cloth. Can. Yeah, they, the little mice can fit through. Yeah. So you want quarter inch hardware cloth, either stainless steel or galvanized. And then we use um, some heavy-duty caulking and sometimes flashing. And that's it. I mean, it's really wow. basic. You just yeah. have to – you know what you have to do? It's, it's the eye for detail because we are looking for holes in and around the base of the house and on the roof mm-hmm. that are half an inch and greater. What we would do is it was we would say, you know, don't use foam. Go back over the places that you did use the expanding foam and okay. replace it with – quarter-inch hardware cloth. Um, it can be made out of stainless steel or galvanized wire. And make sure it's just quarter-inch, not half-inch, because they'll get through half an inch. And then you can support it or um, you know, close it off even more with some heavy-duty caulking or construction sealant. Mm. And that's what you need to use. It's really basic. The tools okay. and the, the supplies that we use are really basic. It really takes the skill to, to find all these little nooks and crannies that they're getting through. We're, all, we're working on one house, this, this poor gal. She's so awesome. She's been the best sport because it's taken us over a month. Um, the way we do it is interesting, um, unconventional, and, but I think it's going to catch on because it's absolutely a brilliant way to do this. Okay, so let's say we came out and we went around the perimeter of your house, mm-hmm. found the places, closed them off, now, that night, we need to set some live catch traps, and we use some called Atomic Barbie. If, if they look like the Atomic Barbie traps online, get those. They're the safest, most humane, and they will catch. Okay. Is it okay to plug a name? 
Oh, it is. It is. It's just okay. laughing at the name. Yeah. I know. So, so we use the atomic Barbie traps that are found on Amazon. They're about twenty dollars. Um, okay. They're um, they're they're sm- small traps, but they catch both mice and rats, and they're super gentle and very very easy to use. So we like to recommend those traps. They're called atomic Barbies, and or or there are other names, but they look just like the atomic Barbie trap. So that's what you'd want to look for. So we would have you buy those ahead of time, or we can sell them to you or rent them to you. We would do the repairs around the base of your house first. Mm-hmm. If you have attic problems, we probably would do a couple things on the roof. But we want to focus on the ground level. That's where they're really coming in usually the most. Oh, okay. And once the house is sealed is when we want to – to put the live catch traps underneath the house so these guys can we can get them out. They they won't last long. They won't last a couple days without food and water. So we want to make sure we've got the ability to get them out. You'll set the traps, you'll check them by ten AM in the morning and hopefully we'll have caught something. Now what you this is this is where it gets a little weird but I really haven't had much pushback from people. Mm-hmm. You get the animals out, you put them out in the yard, you let them go. In your yard and you watch them. And it's kind of funny because some of my clients really get into it. <laughs> They're like, oh, look, I watched him, and he went over here, and, and, I, and I found a section where he was trying to get in, and he can't get in anymore. And that's the thing. Yeah, You're paying yeah. a lot of money to have your house worked on. You want to know that it's rat-proof. You want to know that what we've done has been sufficient enough to keep them out. And the only way to do that is to have the little guys try. Rats yeah. and mice are really smart. Rats are really, really smart. They know exactly how to get back in your house. They follow their trails. They follow their nose. And by the way, their sense of smell is greater than a bloodhound. They know exactly how to get back in your house. So we want them to do that. You want them to do that. You've paid all this money for the repairs. You want to know that by the time we're over and done, you are completely rat-proof. Killing them, if you were to put out snap traps, which a lot of companies do after they've excluded the rodents, Mm-hmm. Then you you don't you won't know for six months or so that the work that was done wasn't good enough because uh, you'll have yeah. more rats getting in. You know what I mean? So yeah. this is the only way yeah. to confirm that the house is rodent proof is by doing this process. And it is a process. It usually lasts about a week, but some of them take a little longer. But um, this is the process. And like yeah. for instance, we're doing that right now with this one um, gal, and we're having to. She's actually dyeing the rats for us the, with vegetable dye. She dyes their foot or their tail. Okay, Mr. Green Tail was getting back in. So we yeah. know we've missed something. Anyway. Oh, that's that, great. That's how we do it. It's really pretty interesting. I think it'll catch on because it really is the only way to do it right. Hmm. So it seems like this is definitely a, a lifetime solution or at least a solution as long as there is regular maintenance done that will – will be permanent, right? You know, yeah, we give a three year guarantee on most things that we do and but if it's if you get three years you're probably gonna get decades. It's really more about the the material of the house. But the, mm-hmm. if, if you have a wooden house and you're not maintaining it and the wood gets soft or rotting, then it will be more of a problem sooner. We do have repellents that we use. They're made out of essential oils. And again, mm-hmm. rats have great sense of smell. So they don't like certain things like eucalyptus oil, peppermint oil, citronella. They don't like these aromatic oils. They're very offensive to them. So if we, uh, sometimes if there's a spot like an open shed where somebody keeps tools, a tool shed, you know, we'll spray some of this stuff in there and it keeps them out for weeks, really. Oh, wow. In, in addition to the, the essential oils we use as repellents, there's a couple things to think about in the, in the yard um, to repel sometimes repel mice and rats, but the larger critters that might want to come into your yard or garden, we have found a couple of of things do help. Um, They can ward them off. They're motion-activated repellers. You can find them online. They they give out a little sound that you can adjust Mm -hmm. and some lights that flash. One of them we like a lot is called um, the Yard Sentinel. There's also a larger unit that sprays water. Great for coyotes, deer, raccoons. You know, any of these things are going to be dependent on how big the draw is. Like, it's not going to be as successful if you've got a banquet in your yard and they're used to it, right? They're they're habituated, they're conditioned to come into your yard. But yeah. it will be really super highly effective if there's nothing really there for them and and you want them to 
keep away. Okay. And that's where we come in is we, we assess the yard, we assess the the draw, the attractant, and, and help you manage so that you've got this balanced ecosystem and not a lot of wildlife presence. Or whatever wildlife presence you want, we can balance it to what, you know, what degree you want. Um, I also want to mention a, a really interesting animal that we have in the area that a lot of people don't don't know about, don't think about when they're using um, kill traps. Uh, mm, there's a rodent, mm-hmm. there's a rodent, and it and it's called the dusky footed wood rat. Oh it's, yeah, um, it, it is a rat. Uh, some people call it the pack rat, but this is a dusky footed wood rat. It is endangered. It's on the California um, list of species of concern, meaning its populations aren't stable. One reason is again they're not really like rats. They're more like hamsters, mm. and they don't have as many babies. And they don't breed throughout the year. They have a, a time during spring and summer where they breed. You might um, have seen these stick formations in the woods, these piles of, you know, conical piles of sticks. And that's yeah, a, a wood rat's yeah. nest. Oh, okay. We have some down by our, our river. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Those are wood rat okay. middens or nests, and they are protected by the state law. You can't destroy them or move them without having authorization from the state. Mm-hmm. And, and the rodents themselves are also protected. So when people are, are – I just had this discussion the other day with someone in a preserve. When pest control companies come in and start um, laying down traps that are indiscriminate and, and they don't know what the target is going to be, they really have to do due diligence, especially when there are wood rats in the area. They must be held accountable and they must do their due diligence by mm-hmm. finding out what is in the attic, or the subfloor, what they're targeting, and make sure it's not a dusky-footed wood rat. These are really, really cool animals. We need them. They're part of our ecosystem, and and they're being killed off by the hundreds probably because of, of pest control company irresponsibility. Oh, that that is sad. So how how can people tell the difference between a wood rat and a what well, you know what we would see as a common rat, which I believe is like a um, a roof rat. Yes, you will yeah. say that is that is a really cute rat. <laughs> it's really, <laughs> really big yeah. and it's really, really cute. They'll yeah. have giant ears and they have more of like a – in horses, we used to describe it as a Roman nose. Their, their head comes out a little bit and then goes down, whereas the there's two other species of rats that um, you'll probably encounter, one more than the other. A roof rat has the giant ears also, very similar to a wood rat. Okay. So the roof rat has giant ears, more of a pointy nose, and the tail is longer than its body. That's the roof rat. Oh, the okay. Norway rat has a large head, large eyes, smaller ears, much smaller ears, and their tail is not as long as their body. Um, but those are the two that you will probably end up seeing that you might confuse with a wood rat. Okay. Um, they are non-natives and they are the only ones that you can kill with the poisons. If you look at the label of a poison box, and I'm not advocating for use of poison, but this is just one of those loopholes that sit there where our wood rats are getting killed because of this um, irresponsibility. In California, the label is the law. When you're using a poison of any kind, there's going to be instructions on the back, restrictions. We're only allowed to use poisons, and I say we collectively, Mm-hmm. on certain species, and those are the non-natives. In California, that's the house mouse, the little teeny tiny house mouse, the roof rat, and the Norway rat. So it's actually illegal for pest control companies to place poison bait stations that could harm native species, that yeah. could harm anything but those three. And you know yeah. they don't they do not do that. And these yeah. bait stations that are put in the house or outside of the house are are not other um, indiscriminate killers. Because not only should we not we shouldn't be using them for that reason, but we shouldn't be using them because all that poison ends up usually getting into other animals like the owls, the bobcats. We've got a tremendous number of bobcats that have come in, and they have pesticide uh, rodenticides in their livers, and mm-hmm. they end up dying because of it. Oh, that's too bad. Hmm. So so where would we find the the wood rats? We find the wood rats in urban areas that are kind of close to oak woodlands or forested areas. They're mm-hmm. all over the Monterey, Monterey Santa Cruz area. Um, the funny thing, we find sometimes that they go into a house at night and seem to, like, party in there and make noise <laughs> and disturb the residents. 
But then when we actually go to monitor it and close it up and set traps for them to get them out safely, uh-huh. they're not in there. So it's almost like they go in at night and have fun, and then they go back to their beautiful stick middens and live there, um, sleep there for the day. Very funny. Funny guys. Yeah. I, I love them. They're one of my favorite species. Uh, so what can people do besides exclusion to uh, rid their property of of rats? Yeah, so, you know, there are some places that, that are very, very difficult to shore up. I mean, mm-hmm. exclusion is number one. You want to protect your structures, whatever they are, the tool shed, the home, outbuildings. Uh, the car, we, we can talk about the car corral at some point. Mm-hmm. So you want to exclude the animals, not allow them in to your space. Now, there's some places that you can't do that. So you can use repellents, what we talked about. And, and then there's um, a couple things that you can do outside of your home to keep those populations down. One of my favorite things to recommend, of course, because it's fun, mm-hmm. barn owls. Barn mm-hmm. owls are our native species of owl, and they – are sedentary, meaning they kind of stick around on a property or within a few miles. So if you put up a barn owl nest box that will attract barn owls because they're cavity dwellers, they'd like to live inside things, hence Mm -hmm. the name barn owl. If you put up a barn owl box, you'll probably attract a couple of barn owls and they will stay residents in there. Um, They'll produce one or two clutches of babies per year. Mm -hmm. One baby one owlet, as it's growing up, can consume the equivalent of 12 mice in a night. So that might be one giant gopher. Oh, um, my gosh. Yeah. yeah, so they really do uh, thousands. They will eat thousands of rodents over a nesting period. And that's one way to naturally keep down your rodent population outside. They're great for gophers. We've had great success stories where we have put up owl boxes. Um, nice. I just want to warn people right here, do not – buy, don't, don't fall for all of those boxes on the internet. They have to be a specific design. They must be large. So anything less than 36 inches wide, don't don't buy it. Uh, we have our oh, own okay. that we build, and we also give our instructions away for free if you want to build your own. But it must be at least 36 inches wide, and the entry hole has to be a certain height, very high, actually, to keep okay. the babies in there sufficiently. Um, the other things that they can yeah. that you can do there are there are a couple um, things new on the market. One of them is called ContraPest. It's a contraceptive that was just brought out about a month ago. Just got um, licensed in California. It's a contraceptive for rodents. Hmm. I know it sounds funny, right? It but it's a way that we can try and reduce their populations without getting poison into other animals. Uh, so, Rebecca, will contrapest, you know, will that affect the the wood rats as well? I think you would want to be careful since they have such uh, low numbers of or low birth rate, I guess. Excellent yeah. question, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you want to make sure that you're not in wood rat territory. You would have somebody like us or another qualified biologist come out and make sure you don't have wood rats. I'm so glad you brought that up. It's really important. But yeah. if you have the Norway rats and the roof rats, it's one way of, of using something that can be kind of set out. Um, it's a little expensive, um, but you can set it out and kind of not worry about it. This is yeah. something that's controlled by the pest control industry, so you'd have to hire somebody, um, a pest control company or, or us, to come out and do that, to place it and monitor it. Um, the other thing that's available now, it's kind of new, it's new to me, is called the A24. Um, it's kind of kind of gross. It's a captive bolt. Um, mm. It's intended, it's a kill trap, but there's no poisons, and uh, it's very, very humane. They're knocked unconscious immediately, so there's no suffering. And then the this is this kind of gross. The carcass is no. there, so if yeah. it wants to be consumed, if there's a if a, there's a neighborhood cat, hopefully not. But if there's a bobcat, a fox, a raccoon, yeah. a coyote, anything that that will be will take that rodent away, you know, it's done. We like it because it's good for places like um, that have that that have recurring. Um, populations of rodents that they absolutely need to keep down, and they they shouldn't and shouldn't use poison. So this is a way of, of really knocking its population down fast, without risk to other animals. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's, so. it's brand new. A couple places yeah. I know are using it, and it's successful. A twenty four. 
Uh, it's so, made by good, good Nature, I believe, and it's a uh, little trap that gets set up on a, a, either a tree trunk or uh, inside the house in the attic, and the animal goes up to it, sniffs it, and it gets knocked, it's knocked out. Dead. So, yep, knocked wow. out. And that wow. it's uh, certified humane. I mean, that is that yeah. is one of the ways that that to to perform euthanasia, if you will, right. um, that's approved in our country. Yeah, so going back, just a, a step back to the contraceptive a little bit. So if if I wanted someone who, like you or, or someone similar to you, to come in and assess, could could I request that instead of um, using a poison or any other method that would seem harmful? Is that something that, that you can ask your, your uh, wildlife control people to come in and use? Now or yeah, can, I don't can you buy it personally or you cannot buy it personally. Okay. It is it's something that's restricted and you have to have a qualified applicator's license to okay. to place it. So we would uh, call someone it, like you to come in yeah. and yeah. Okay. Yeah, or a pest control company. Hopefully they're they're moving towards this. It is a little expensive, but you pass that on to the consumer. If they're willing to, to pay for it, it's certainly a much better alternative than any of the poisons. We've hmm. got to get off the poisons. It's just killing yeah. our pre- predator species. Hmm. So I, you know, I was hoping before I let you go to Rebecca that we could segue into talking about or having you talk about your your app uh, to help with wildlife rescue. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. One of the biggest problems faced by people who find animals in distress is. Who do you call? How do you get in touch with somebody that knows what they're doing and can help you? It's it's a chronic problem. And so in, oh gosh, 2011, I think it was, um, I started designing this app for for use on iPhones and, and eventually on Androids. So it's called Wild Help. It's free for download on, at the iTunes store, and it'll work nationwide. If you find a wild animal in distress, um, it'll go. It'll ask you questions like, you know, what kind of animal did you find? And it's very, very simple to use. It'll ask you some questions that are really going to help the the hospital or the rescuer that you get in touch with. Mm-hmm. And towards the end of answering these questions, if you, for example, said something like, oh, it's a baby um, squirrel and it's curled up in a ball, then it's going to give you instructions on how to keep that baby safe and warm. Warmth is really critical to get to an animal that's hypothermic yeah. quickly. So it'll give you some of these instructions to first aid instructions to keep the animal alive um, oh, while you're great. searching for the person to come and help it. Um, then at the end, it'll give you a selection of three responders that specialize in, for example, the squirrel or whatever animal, whatever species you chose, you know, because some of the hospitals are species specific. Mm-hmm. Some only do deer, some only do aquatics, birds. Um, so it'll, it'll, it'll filter through for you and give you the three closest uh, places that specialize in what you've said you found. And it bases it off of your location. So it geolocates the three closest Place. Or and, so, and also advice on, for example, rabbits and deer. Yeah. They leave their babies for eight hours at a time. So there's a oh. little warning at the end. If you're saying you found a little spotted fawn, for example, it'll say, uh, "Hold on, wait a minute. They leave them for hours. Are you sure? You know, maybe you should leave it. It'll give suggestions on what to do to kind of filter through. Yeah. If it's injured, of course, we want to get it into a hospital. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. Oh, it's going to say another really common one is people saying that they found a baby bird that can't fly. Well, birds spend at least a week on the ground learning to fly, and it's yeah. the most critical stage of their development. It's where they learn their song, their social um, habits, their uh, where to eat, where to hide. All we cannot, as humans, we cannot provide them in a rehabilitation setting. So we do not want people to pick up healthy baby birds. We want them to leave them there. And then people say, well, it's a cat. There's cats in the neighborhood, but that's a cat problem. That's a people problem. And we're not going to orphan a wild animal. We're not going to disrespect a wild animal and their families because of our, you know, we want cats outdoors. No, you're going to do your best to protect the animal from the cats and let it 
let it grow up naturally with its yeah. natural parents. Is is there a situation where you should just not help the animal in in some cases and just let nature take its course? It's going to be case by case. So okay. deer and 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 turkeys or and quail highly sensitive animals and so it's almost best to just let nature take its course but okay. we, we don't want to really say that as a general rule that should be up to the person that picks up the phone like myself answering you know asking you questions and then and then making a plan of action based on what you, you tell me yeah so you get you have a set of questions to, to assess the situation yeah. and yeah all good is there anything else that you and your husband are working on that you want to talk about with our listeners today there is there is something else we're working on. Um, it's called cat gardens or catios. There's two hmm. different things. We're really pushing to get cats, domestic cats, contained. It doesn't mean that you have to put them in a cage. We don't want that. It's not good mm-hmm. for the cats. But we want to take care of both the cats, the welfare. We want to focus on the welfare of the cats and the welfare of our wildlife. Yeah. Cats that are free roaming, they're allowed to free roam decimate wildlife. It's like scorched earth. And they can't help it. They just that's just what they do. They that's what it. they do. Yeah, yeah. So we're really we're promoting the use of certain types of fencing material so that your cat can have free roam of your backyard or whatever area you want to dedicate to your cat. Free roam does not have to have a top on it. It's just the, hmm. the trick of putting a cat fence on the border. Very easy to do, not expensive. A little time consuming, but once you do it again, like the rats, you know, once you once you fix the house, once you fix the fence, your cat's going to be in forever. They can have the freedom of the backyard, but they're not free to go over, you know, go out and go roaming the woods or go to somebody else's property and and kill all the wildlife or or go to the bathroom on somebody else's property. So, I think personally, I, I would love to see more and more of this talked mm-hmm. about about cats, free roaming cats, and what they do to the environment. Um, in a, a local sense, and then also the uh, feral cat colonies um, are an issue because they bring in the predators, right. and then they bring in the mesopredators, the raccoons, the possums, skunks that people complain about and then want to kill. Right. And it, but it starts with the feral cats. Um, so we're, we're working on a program to get places adopt containment centers for these cats. Like, uh, we call them cat gardens. Mm. It's a place for feral cats to be contained. They can be visited and fed and safely housed. They can be medicated regularly, um, taken in for um, medical treatment when they need need it. But for feral cats, there's one missing um, step, which makes feral cats, maintaining feral cat colonies, a cruel end for a cat's life. And, okay. and, and that is this. They, they don't get continued health. And right. then for our environment, they impose a lot of risk to our wildlife. They kill wildlife, and then their poop ends up contaminating waterways and killing sea otters. Mm. I never thought of that. Wow. Yep. Yeah. So wow. We're, that's one of our – you asked about what else we're working on, and that's yeah. what we're, we're pushing is to keep cats contained. It's good for the cats, good for the environment. You know, I love I love the idea of a catio, actually. I think that's great. And um, I'm going to backtrack just, just a tad, too, because I had this question on my mind, but – and I wanted to ask it before I let you go. Are people pretty satisfied or are people pretty willing to work with these more humane methods of of controlling the rodent po- population around their property that, that you're working with? Very. Yeah. And some yeah. people seek us out because of their faith or just their philosophy. They don't want to kill right. anything. And they just didn't know they had a an alternative, and they're so right. happy when they find us and find how, how we operate. Um, I think most people in general, what I'm finding is they don't want to kill the animal. They just want their problem resolved mm-hmm. and rather not have an animal lose its life. Um, and They just didn't know that there was an alternative. So now there is, and this new branch of, of wildlife control, um, I think it's emerging. It's really um, gaining gaining popularity where it is, uh, where we're located. There's about 20 of us in the United States that practice exclusively humane options. It doesn't mean that these companies are non-lethal. Um, we do have a couple of methods that we use to, to kill animals, but we have criteria when and where it's going to be appropriate, and we certainly want to do it with um, the most respect 
and, and with um, the least amount of pain and suffering. Um, we do kill ground squirrels and gophers under certain circumstances when they are going to cause a damage to a structure or health of people, and we, we use carbon monoxide. And it, it puts them basically to sleep. They pass out before suffering asphyxiation. So we find we feel that that's an okay death um, mm-hmm. because we don't want people to use poison. And yeah. there really is yeah. we have not found any other way to get rid of, for example, really large ground squirrel populations that that will impact, for example, in schools. Uh, they'll impact the children's health. You know, they can fall and twist an ankle, or they could get contaminated with the fleas that these these animals might have at a certain time of season and population size. So we're okay with that. Um, So humane does not mean non-lethal. It just means Mm -hmm. the utmost care in reducing suffering of animals that do have to die and and reducing suffering under any circumstance, whether they're in the traps. So we have criteria when our traps are checked, our our live catch traps. Uh, We don't use traps on any other animals besides mice and rats. Um, because it's cruel. They are not humane traps. You hear people talk about the have-a-heart types of traps. They're not humane. The animals mm-hmm. get really hurt inside and exposed to the elements, so we don't use them at all. As you know, it's all about exclusion. Thank you for listening to Be Provided Conservation Radio. Links and resources to today's topic are in our show notes on iTunes. We appreciate your dedication and interest in protecting our natural world for future generations. If you like what you heard, please get involved by volunteering, donating, and sharing these podcasts with your friends. It also helps us to inform more people if you take a minute to leave a rating or review on iTunes. Have a great day, and thank you for listening to Be Provided Conservation Radio.